favorite taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste. Welcome to Great Taste. We're live at Green Building Supply. That's your cue. Come on. That's it. That's good. Be, yeah. That excellent. Good work. Good work. I'm Steve Boss, and we're here the first Tuesday of every month. And we are about to have 60 minutes of nonstop food, action, information, and hopefully fun. So let's just get ready. This is a presentation of Fairfield Media Center. Thank you always to Green Building Supply for hosting this and for everybody's, to everybody's Whole Foods for supplying all the food for us. And we're going to get right into the show. So my first guest is Dr. Yashu Sharma. She is working on some very interesting research, right? And you want to come over here so we can all see you and talk with you, right? So that, and tell us about how long you've been working on this research and exactly what it is. Uh, actually, I'm working on the medicinal and aromatic herbs. And I'm working on since uh, around 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, I saw, I Googled you, so I found some information about some papers and things like that. So yeah. she's working on the medicinal value of essential oils, essentially with herbs. Yeah medicinal and aromatic herbs mm -hmm. and in aromatic herbs I'm working on the importance of aromatic herbs, the medicinal importance of the aromatic herbs and its aromatic importance, the use of essential oils in aromatherapy, health and also in like different uses, maybe in perfumes or how the distillation of the essential oils and all. And in cooking? Yeah, in cooking also, yeah. Essential oils can be used in cooking as well as uh, different other, uh, like even the herbs, the aromatic herbs directly used in cookings, like you all know, mm -hmm. the oregano, thyme, rosemary, sage and all. Mm. And also the essential oils, which is uh, extracted from these herbs can be used in cooking as well as for healing. So. We're actually going to use an essential oil that uh, is going to be used of orange mm -hmm. to make something that many of us grew up. We like when this store opened in our neighborhoods or whatever. When we were little, we were all went there, and because it was called Orange Julius, which you may not be familiar with, but they used to actually squeeze fresh oranges, yes. oranges, but they haven't done that for years. But uh, we're going to have uh, Laura Anderson is going to do her own version of that, so we're going to see how that turns out. But it's going to use an essential oil, and one of the other things that we're going to do is we're going to show people how they can actually uh, at home very simply uh, infuse oils yes. because that's really simple to do. Yes, yeah. Uh, actually infusion of essential oils has to be done for especially for healing purpose. Infusion with the aerosols can be used and also hydrosols can be used the essential oil and the water mixture which is readily available and also the infusion of the essential oils with the uh, an, another carrier oil any of the carrier oil and also like it can be used for uh, like massage therapy mm. and also for like the inhale inhaling because the essential oils make the uh, works on the nervous system and also the brain and it relaxes our now the uh, it is called as the olfactory nerves. It relaxes our brain and makes the mind calm and helps for relaxation. Some of the oils which helps for the relaxation are the lemon, lavender, bergamot, and those who the uh, the oils which contain the linalool. So they are they helps for the relaxation. And what do they contain again? Linalool. It's a chemical compound called as uh, the ketone or the terpene com component of the essential oil. Mm. Now, essential oils, is that something, I and mean, you do it in the, your laboratory, right? Yes, yes. Now, and I've seen your equipment, and we actually yes. posted a picture of it. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of beakers and tubes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is this something that people can actually do at home? Yes, of course, they can do at home. Uh, it's a very, like, it's not too much expensive. I have bought after coming here, I came one year back to the Fairfield and after coming here, I bought that in Amazon. Like everybody can do that online and for about 230 bucks. 
and that too like mine is a two liters one means half gallon and even the quarter gallon also available for about 180 to 200 bucks means much less cost and from that it is really like the whole kit is available along with the like the heating mantle and the whole kit it cost and readily available and all the how to like attach everything how to set means everything is available as a kit mm. in a book mm. so you you have to just set up those and then you can use your own herbs because it's not like difficult to grow herbs here most of the essential her essential oil containing herbs or aromatic herbs grow as a weed here example the mint <laughs> and yeah. it just my, my wife thinks of it as a weed yeah, yeah you know that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the first time because in india we cultivate that we give so much of attention for growing all those herbs, but it's so easy to grow here. So most of the herbs, they just perennial herbs after like uh, the uh, winter, they just come up like oregano, thyme and the mint and chamomile. And those are very important, the perennial herbs, which you just, you have to harvest them from your backyard and then you can just extract them by using the very low cost equipment. Now, is this equipment, what's the methodology? Is it steam distillation? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different types of distillation mm -hmm. and extraction of essential oil from the aromatic herbs. So among them, the distillation is a very like easily, you can do it at home. And this is a steam distillation. From di steam distillation, you can extract the maximum amount of oil with a very less time, means it's a very cost efficient method for extraction of the essential oil from the aromatic herbs. Now, when I was reading a little bit about it, I was finding that there are other methods, as you mentioned, and those methods kind of, hmm, they were kind of caused me to pause. Like one was using your microwave. There was, there was equi equipment for that. Another was using food grade ethyl alcohol. Yes. And, and those were things that I kind of like, hmm, so, I was thinking about it in terms of culinary because that's usually all I think about. And in restaurants, I could just imagine that so many high-end chefs are probably using some types of essential oils that they're distilling themselves. And I can also imagine that for the most part, because the process is so much simpler using microwaves, that's probably how they're going about doing it, or ethyl alcohol, you know, as opposed to the steam distillation. So if you have any comments about these three methods, that would be very interesting. Uh so about the ethanol extraction so it's not that much easy uh, as you think so it's a little bit difficult usually it is known as the solvent extraction it is done at industrial level it is mainly used for extraction of some of the delicate aromas especially for flowers like rose jasmine and magnolia lang lang so those flowers those who contain a very delicate aroma so by doing the steam distillation, in steam distillation, you are applying heat to them. So by applying heat, the uh, aroma or uh, the delicate node degenerates or destroy. So therefore, so you have to do a cold extraction by using the different solvents. So and you have to put more efforts to remove the solvent too. Mm -hmm. So because it's not uh, the food grade uh, solvent, so there they use the benzene, hexane, and those are the commonly used solvents. So that the maximum amount of oil you will get. So in ethyl alcohol and all, you can use that, the food grade like vodka also, you can use them. So and those can be used like uh, for uh, the kitchen purpose or for your culinary purpose. But there the maximum extraction is not possible. So only for home scale you can do it. So whatever the herb, you will just collect it and store it. But uh, you may not uh, preserve this for a long period of time, but if you do extract the essential oil, so which is very concentrated, for example, by steam distillation, if you steam distill around 100 pounds of lavender, you will get only one pound of oil. So it's highly concentrated. So whatever you get in the market, so it is not pure, though they like usually always in the organic 100% essential oil in the label, though they put 100% essential oil, it's not 100%. So there will be some carrier oil, but you won't know because so essential oil, it readily immerse or they 
dilute or the they so dissolve in carrier oils too so you don't know so whether it's a pure or not so that's why in the market so you will get for 10 ml from two dollars to twenty hundred dollars too so you don't know which one to buy so but if you have your own equipment and if you have your own distillation or if you always like health is better than everything so though it cost more but i always think that by doing your own essential oil it won't cost more mm -hmm. it's always better so because the essential oil you can use for all the purpose for cooking health healing aromatherapy and also for a common like room freshener for surface cleaning because most of them they have a antimicrobial properties antiseptic properties so you can use for anything so there is no barrier for using your natural own pure so you, and you can uh, preserve them for more than like 4 5 years so it's not like even for if you store for 10 years also it will be like as the when first day you distill the same will be there okay so i just want to clarify this so what you extract at home using this steam distillation method will stay in its pure form if you i'm assuming you keep it in a dark cool yes, place dark, yeah dark mm -hmm. um, container dark airtight container you mm -hmm. should yeah and and it'll last for 5 10 years yes yeah yeah of course yeah so and i am like now i am doing some essential oil extraction classes in weekends in saturday like already i have completed the introduction course and again 3 weeks uh it's there uh every till august end so every saturday from 1:30 to 4:30 at sustainable living department of the marsh university of management okay so if you could send our heather maybe wherever she is oh there she is uh if you could send me all that information and i'll get it out to people then so people could take advantage of it if if it's possible right is it still possible uh okay great so this is just fascinating i mean really i'm very excited i know my wife is really excited also because she can already go kaching kaching he's going to figure out he's going to buy this stuff you know I, you know it's he's going to get on amazon yeah. tonight and all that kind of stuff right and so. all these extraction procedures are also available in youtube you can see but always you doing by your hand is different from seeing so when you see how to harvest the herbs how to preserve it how to dry it because some of them they are extracted when fresh when some of them they are extracted when they you can dry it the herb whenever it's available you can harvest it dry it and store it so even store it for one year so it doesn't like you can keep it fresh or it won't spoil because of the its antimicrobial property or uh, the antibacterial property let me ask you a question because i want to think about it in terms of culinary so we're going to make a uh, an infusion mm -hmm. all right of i think of garlic oh, all right mm -hmm. now if we did that at home mm -hmm. and through this particular process that you're talking about with the extraction process right and we came up with i don't know you know like a uh, 20 liter 20 ml liters of garlic infused oh, yeah. infused garlic right uh or essential oil of garlic then i'm assuming that you probably if you wanted to infuse some olive oil with that you wouldn't hardly use any of it because it's so strong i imagine yes, yeah mm. and for the dilution ratio is 1 is to 100 for 100 ml you can add 1 ml oil. 400 ml 100 yeah 100 one, is 1 yeah wait for 400 ml to 1 ml of extraction 100 ml oh okay 100, 100 4 to 1 okay i got you yeah. all right so for 100 ml of almond oil or any like carrier oil it may be coconut oil so or jojoba oil so just 100 ml of the carrier oil you have to add 1 ml of the essential oil it it again depends upon the type of oil mm. some of them are very strong even for 400 500 ml if you add one drop that's enough mm. but some are like very mild so you have to add a little bit even 40 50 ml you have to add 1 mm. ml yeah Thank you so much. It was so very interesting, and uh, I can't wait to learn more about it. Dr. Yashu Sharma, thank you so thank much. You. Okay, okay. Okay, so now Hi. this lovely lady, Soleil Thorstein's daughter. Yes. How did I do? That was perfect. Ooh. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell us, tell us what you're going to be doing. 
Um, so today we are going to make a coleslaw and then a summer succotash with a balsamic vinaigrette. Mm. Um, they're both super simple. They're, you know, it's farming season right now and there's all this nice produce coming at you from the farmer's market and all of that stuff. So this is a great way to start utilizing some of that and kind of eat healthy at the same time. Okay, so tell us a little bit about wh what are you going to start with? Um, I'm going to, let me move this out of the mm -hmm. way. I'm going to start with the dressing. Here. Okay. Do I get to hold no. it? I was like, no. <laughs> you cannot touch that. Uh, I'm glad you were paying attention. Okay. So you're going to start with the dressing. I didn't realize this was already. Yeah, that's, like, that's quite all right. It's, it's good. Um, yeah, so the dressing is pretty simple. It's going to be your regular balsamic vinegar and olive oil with a few things to kind of ex accent. So I have here, um, let's go through the ingredients first so you can stay along with me. I have one garlic clove minced up. This looks like a little bit much for what I'm going to use. <laughs> um, I have some honey here uh, to help sweeten it up a little bit and round it out. The sugar, even though sometimes, you know, you think about diabetics and glycemic index and all of that, you can switch out the sweetener for an agave if you need to or... Um, yeah, basically anything. I like using a liquid sweetener so that I don't have to worry about sugar granules in my dressing because it's I'm not heating it up, obviously. Um, and then I love using raw honey, of course. Um, and it what it does is it really brings together all of the flavors really well. So I suggest and recommend using a sweetener, even if you're being sugar conscious. Yeah, I think that's something that is a really good tip for people when they're making a vinaigrette, you know, because anything like that, that acid can be balanced more and rounded, like you said, with a little bit of sweetness to it. It's a really nice mm -hmm. touch. Um, then I have some salt, always in anything and everything that I do, there is salt in it. Um, just a hint, also it brings out the sweetness, so you don't have to add as much sugar to it because you add salt and that accents. So it ends up being like this, everything kind of plays off of each other. Um, and then it's just balsamic vinegar and olive oil, so it's pretty simple. Oh, I see which one you chose. I gave her a choice of three different ones, so that's <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, I taste tested all of them. This one was, it. balsamic can be sweet on its own, so that can also uh, lower the amount of sugar that you use. Um, and this one was very nice and sweet and also had like a very nice viscosity to it that I really liked. So we're going to use that one. Um, so since I, when I'm in a restaurant, I will do this in a blender because then um, you get an emulsification, which is the blending of your oil and your vinegar, which usually just want to separate and not stay together. Um, in this case, since this, um, I would rather not use the blender right now, we're going to do it in a jar. This is your standard ball jar for jams. Right. And I, I forgot to mention, you are also known as the Wandering Knife. People can find you on Instagram that yes. way, at the Wandering Knife, and also on Facebook probably. Yes. Yes. And you are you have a pop-up going in town right now till? Um, I officially have the keys and management control until August 18th, <laughs> on which the owner returns. <laughs> and the owner I, happens to be your grandmother, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep that a secret <laughs> until people try my food. <laughs> oh, oh. Do you know this is being videotaped? You know? <laughs> well, she's not so technically inclined, so maybe she won't see it unless I show it to her. <laughs> um, yeah, and then when she gets back, I'll have to help smooth the transition back and of course teach her all the recipes that she wants to steal from me <laughs> so yeah okay all right, so, so we're into the jar you can't see I any of you this put it over here maybe yeah there we go all right, right i'm gonna use only uh, about one teaspoon of this for now um then also one teaspoon of the honey Ooh, it's goopy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, where'd the salt go? A couple shakes of salt. And rough, I'm going to do a third cup of balsamic. Whenever you're making a dressing of any kind, there's a one to two ratio of vinegar to oil. I'm going to tell you something that I you may find interesting. Yeah. When this generation, <laughs> uh, not yours, 
this generation was growing up, it was three to one. And it's oh, changed yeah. over time. It's shrunk, yeah. shrunk, 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 shrunk. Because we used to have, okay, who knows this? <laughs> Don't stand out there. <laughs> we used to have those good seasons. Remember good seasons, right? The packets, right? And they came with the little shaker jar, right? And so you had to add the vinegar and then it had little marks on the beak on the jar, you know, to fill up. And they also put water. You had to put water in too, but it was basically three yeah, yeah, I know. But it was basically three to one between the vinegar and the oil and the water. And now it's it's two to one, which is very interesting to me. I don't know why, but it, it is. Yeah. Um, so w when you're doing this in a jar, it, the emulsification that you're getting, that mixture of the olive oil and the vinegar, is hardest to start. So I'm only going to add a little bit of olive oil in the very first shot and try and get it to a, like a homogenous consistency before adding... Well, I think I'm going to add it in three spurts. Just give it a nice little shake. A lovely sound. Mm -hmm. And it's easy, so easy to do at home. Most people have jars, so. Yeah, that too. Um, a third method you can do, yeah, if you look in this, you'll see that there are no large oil bubbles in it. And it's all like one liquid going on in there. Um, I'm going to add a full third cup now. See how that goes. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so the last way you can do it is with a whisk and a bowl. That's very easy. Um, again, you want to mix all of the ingredients before adding the oil together and then slowly add your oil in. What are you doing in threes? That's what you said, yeah, right? Yeah, three. You know, we'll do we'll do your three to one. No, oh no, do the two. That's yeah, I think, I think, that's. I think I had a memory lapse. I think you're right. No, I'm not right. You're right. <laughs> it is these days. It's two to one. You know, it's know. it's, yeah, yeah. It's shrunk. Moral, yeah. This is somebody is trying to stretch recipes. <laughs> <laughs> With the three to one, right? Trying to stretch because yeah. you get more. Yeah. Ooh, this looks really good. All right. Most important thing is to taste test, like mm -hmm. always, every step. If I taste test raw eggs, like in my quiche bases, to make sure, like it, you, if you taste test every step of the way, you'll guarantee that you have a good result. Ooh, it came out. That's mm -hmm. good. It's very nice. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Really smooth. It it's not at all. A lot of people don't like. The vinegariness of vinegar, whether it's balsamic or whether it's something else, this is very smooth. That, yeah. that honey just kind of cuts it. Yeah. It's lovely. It's very nice and well-rounded. All right. So next is the salad that we are dressing with this. Um, and so a succotash usually has a bean base, like a white bean base to it. So I call it a summer succotash <laughs> because it doesn't have beans in it. Um, but instead, I have snap peas. Um, so it's basically tomato, snap peas, and corn, and that's it. Mm. And it's really delicious. Mm. So what are you going to do exactly with the... Um, these are all raw. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to... These are... Um, they came to me pre-strung. Mm. So usually you would have to take that little fibrous bit off, but with these I don't have to worry about it. Then the corn I have already shucked. This is... Oh, this is everybody's corn. I'm thinking my corn at the coffee house is um, from Dan Walker. It's like some the only organic corn in town at the moment. This, this is actually organic local corn yeah, too, but sells, I don't know where it's. To okay, so that's, <laughs> that's it's probably the why, same one. That's okay. why. Um, all right, is this my knife? It, it can nope. it can be if you like. Oh, you, you mean you you brought your own? Uh huh. Right over there. Yes, and you don't what. Well, that's right. I, I heard that. Who said that? Who said that? Excellent. Okay, the wandering knife. On. <laughs> right. So the name, the wandering knife, actually came from the fact that I travel a lot, and I've picked up a lot of my recipes and a lot of my, I don't know, style from going places and then using local ingredients, but kind of incorporating flavors from other places that I have already been. And then also from the fact that I carry this one knife with me, it is currently this knife. <laughs> um, 
and I have travel, I know how to travel well, so I always have like a little backpack or like a carry-on luggage, but I always have to check it because of this large eight inch knife. <laughs> yeah, and then this thing has been to more countries than many other people, <laughs> so. You know what, I'm gonna move some of these so that you can show people how they can easily, what the best method is for getting the kernels off a fresh ear of corn. All right, um, well, I have taught all of the people that work with me at the coffee house how I do it. <laughs> um, I just go at it. I leave it whole and I try to get square kind of, uh, I don't know, it feels pretty simple and pretty basic. <laughs> um, the it actually one looks wanna, pretty basic and simple. The one thing you want to be aware of, um, I did have somebody start cutting into the core of the corn, which is really tough and you'll feel that resistance against your knife. And if you're cutting that off, it's going to end up in your salad and then you're going to end up having to eat it. And it's not as enjoyable as the corn kernels. I guarantee mm. that. That is, I, I, that looks good. I'm going to try that. I, I definitely, so, I use one of those little cheater devices that you just kind of go like oh, this, you know, and, and that looks, I, I like that. that existed. Yeah. So what I did here was cut a square around it. So the first, you, then you don't have to worry about your corn kernel, like rolling off your cutting board. And so the second side and all the other sides are pretty easy. Mm. Now, while Soleil's doing the rest of that, I'm gonna tell you something really great to do with these. Because they, uh, you could feed chickens, but what you can do is take about six of them, and you can put more if you like, six of them in a pot with water, with fresh basil, just a whole bunch of fresh basil, with a couple of fresh tomatoes, and a few peppercorns, not too many, just a few peppercorns, and about, I'd say about two quarts of water and, and salt. And then you're going to cook that for about an hour, hour and a half, and you're gonna have a delicious corn broth at that point Good. that you can use for all kinds of things. I use it when I make a corn, sweet corn risotto, for example. It's, it's awesome that way, but it's just perfect. It's, 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 a beautiful way to, to use this because all the wonderful juices that are inside are going to come out into that broth. So it's, it's great. Nice. All right. So next we have the tomato. Ooh, this little inlet. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Manual dexterity. It's so nice for my mise en place and now it's fighting me. Um, now, you know what? Let's talk about that for one second. Yeah. And then I'm going to get Dan Gorman up here because we're going to try to multitask a little bit. Okay, but, but you used a term that is incredibly important in professional kitchens and yes. has the same value in home kitchens, and that's mise en place. Mm -hmm. So would you like to explain that and then maybe tell people what the value of it is, not only for yeah, yeah. the professional, but also in the home? Um, so from what I remember, it translates to <laughs> um, mind in place. And it basically means you've collected all of your ingredients, you've portioned out what you need for the recipe that you're gonna forge ahead with. And it clears your mind, it clears your workspace so that it's organized so that you can pay attention to the details and the nature of the fire that's under your food or, you know, tasting the dressing instead of having to worry, oh, did I chop that carrot just right? You know, things like that. Um, and so in the professional kitchen, it's about being ready for dinner service because everything is to order, but then there's a lot of things that are prepped or par cooked prior to the start of service. So it's about having all of those little components for that main dish completely ready before you start, that sort of thing. And in the home kitchen just as important because it allows you to really free your mind and not be caught up in details. If you have everything already portioned out and in its own place. And the other thing that it allows you to do, if you do that ahead of time, is you don't have to think about whether or not, like you said, mm -hmm. did I put the salt in because the container was there? Oh, the salt was there. You know, so you know if you're mixing a cake batter or whatever, you don't have to think about it ahead of time because all the ingredients are out and you just use them in order. Yeah. All right, so this is a beautiful farm tomato from, I believe, Edie. Um, anyway, all you need to do is get the core out. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna cut it into large chunks. I usually recommend using a serrated knife because not all home kitchens have knives that are sharp enough to get through without crushing the tomato. Um, and then this guy, I like to cut into third, 
three sections so that I don't lose any of the meat. Um, and then I just cut my cubes large enough so that one cube has the core in it, just like so. And then everything else to whatever. I like that. Whatever size. Yeah, then there's no waste. Yeah. You know. I'm usually like cutting the core out first, but that's, I like that. Yeah. yeah, it keeps it simple. And then just like nice large chunks. This is whatever you feel like. It's your kitchen. That knife is nice and sharp. I know. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Beautiful. Yeah. Really this beautiful. is why I have to bring my stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's nice. I like that. Just guarantee. And then it's also yeah. every knife has a different weight and a different feel. And so because this is the one that I work with every day, it's the one that just feels most natural. All right. That's the tomato. And then it's literally as simple as throwing our snap peas on top. A little bit of salt. In let's it. let's move this. Oh, yeah. Let's right. move this over here. <laughs> All right, there we go. So we have the bowl with the corn, tomatoes, and now for our snap peas. Oh, do you have? There's a little bit of stuff on these guys. <laughs> um, and then I like any vegetable. It's going to bring out the flavors if you salt it just a little bit, even before the dressing. So the the dressing needed its own salt. The vegetables need their own love and their own salt. Um, so just like the tiniest bit, especially for those tomatoes and the corn. Um, and then it's... Want a bigger bowl? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> that would work. That would be super helpful, actually. I lost a tomato bit. There we go. Nice. It was nice because then you could see it. It makes really pretty layers mm -hmm. in a clear bowl. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to be helpful. It usually happens that way, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, also, this, it's so few ingredients that you don't even really need to toss it. I just pour the dressing on top or nice. maybe a little bit on the bottom. Also because they'll, the like little, I don't know, fingers and it'll start looking mushy if you toss it too much. So just the tiniest bit. Oh, and look at the colors. Mm -hmm. It's like a, yeah. it's a beautiful black molasses gloss on top. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, do I have a spoon? You do. Great. And do you salt? Put some more salt? Or do you taste um, it first? I always taste. Mm. Taste. The amount of salt is obviously going to depend on how much produce you have if you're working with. Righty, moment of truth. It's good. It's good. Okay. Excellent. Right. That's awesome. So that's the succotash. That's the succotash. That was really easy. Yeah. Okay. That perfect. And that's something anybody can make in just a few minutes at home. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. So the next thing is the slaw. Yes. Right? So I, can we, can we get rid mm -hmm. of these corn hulls? Yep. <laughs> that's um, a little bit that. of mise en place happening <laughs> right now, resetting for the next <laughs> dish. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to let you get ready for a Go minute, yeah. and I'm going to just talk a little bit about the rest of the show. So we're going to, by the way, you're watching, I think that's right, right? You're, wa you're watching Great Taste at Green Building Supply, and this is a presentation of Fairfield Media Center, and you can find us on their YouTube channel. All you have to do is go to www.fairfieldmediacenter uh, backslash YouTube that forward slash Oh, wait a minute. www.youtube forward.com slash Fairfield Media Center, and you can find it. And I'm fascinated just watching Soleil cut the, the slaw. But anyway, I want to tell you that we're also going to be making Rubens. That's going to come up uh, at the end of the show because that's the only way we can do it and make sure that everybody's going to have an opportunity. But as part of the Rubens, we're going to uh, use a Thousand Island very simple Thousand Island dressing. We'll show you, you know, what we did for that. And also we're going to be using Dan Gorman, Mr. Bubbling Brine Brother himself, his pickles and his sauerkraut. So if you're not familiar with Dan and his company Bubbling Brine Brothers, the stuff that he turns out is absolutely delicious. We're going to use the kraut and we're going to use the pickles both on the Rubens. And if you got here before the show started, you had Virgin Mary's that also had the pickle as the garnish instead of celery. So that was pretty cool. I liked it. Hi. How are you doing, Steve? Great. And what, are you gonna, what did you bring that's special that nobody's had before? Well, I brought pretty much just salt brined fermented vegetables. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Basically, instead of using vinegar, you just use 
half cup of salt, good salt and good water to a gallon of brine. And then just whatever herbs, fresh herbs, thyme, garlic, oregano, um, just whatever, rosemary. And then just throw all your vegetables in there. But these today I brought just pickles, cucumbers and carrots and onions. And this is a good time of the year to do this because you just have so much stuff coming out of your garden. And these don't necessarily last as long as the ones in vinegar. They don't stay as good, but they are way more complex because they're fermented. And so it's just a really good way to use your cucumbers that are just overproducing or just any vegetable. I've pickled so many different kinds of vegetables and they stay crispy and they're so delicious. You can just pickle garlic even. Pickle's kind of a misnomer too because a lot of people just think when they think of a pickle, they think of vinegar. But really, I mean, yeah, you could use salt water and get a very similar thing because it creates lactic acid and vinegar is acetic acid. So they're both organic acids. So I would say anything preserved in an organic acid is a pickle. But in America, a pickle is a cucumber and vinegar. <laughs> Can you give us that recipe one more time? So it's a half cup of salt per gallon of water. And you mix that as your brine and then just pour that over the vegetables or tea, two tablespoons per quart. Two tablespoons of salt per quart. Yeah. And you use sea salt? I use real salt. Real salt, okay. Yeah, I think real salt is probably the best salt you can get your hands on okay. because it's from an ancient like ocean mine out of Utah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just really good. And I've had just incredible results with it time okay. and time again. Okay, now do we, is there anything we have to be careful about at home or is it just as simple as that? We just, then we take that stuff and we put the vegetables in and we bottle it. Yeah, because every vegetable, everything that's terrestrial growing has bacteria on it that can ferment. So you're just facilitating their growth. Like literally everything. All of us even have it on our skin. You just can't see it. It's so funny people are so scared of bacteria and everything, but you'd die real quick if you didn't have that. A painful death. <laughs> Slow and painful. And um, that's why, uh, you know, like... <laughs> I didn't know this was turning into a horror show. No, okay. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, people, people get so, people are so scared of like things that are, that are not like perfectly clean, even vegetables and everything. But it's like we live in a world where everything is covered in fungi and bacteria that promote life in every way. It's just, we're just now starting to figure it out because we can't see. But especially in America, you know, where people are the sickest at this point <laughs> and, and unhealthy. But like you look at like China where, where they embrace all of these fermentation traditions, people live the longest and they're the healthiest. So I think, I think it's coming around and science is backing it up. So... I mean, and it's delicious. Mm. It makes the most complex flavors. If you think about it, the most high-end, most delicious things are all fermented. And you can't give me one example that's not. Cheese, wine, coffee, chocolate, vanilla, uh, everything. Wow. Sauerkraut. Yeah, it just... Yeah, I don't, I don't care for kimchi because I don't have a very high spice tolerance, but that doesn't mean the rest of the world doesn't. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just like all of the delicacies have fermentation in them at some point mm. because it creates these amazing flavors. Foie gras? Uh, is that stuffed goose? Is that that? <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. I don't, I don't think it's fermented, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, so... Do we fill up the? I just want to know the process. Do we fill the jar up all the way? Do we um, put it in the refrigerator? How long do we need to leave it? All those things. So I would fill the the jar with vegetables and then pour the brine over it and then have something to hold it down. I usually like to use a cabbage leaf because I know that it's completely covered in the bacteria, and just so that it's under the brine is probably the number one key. And then open it every. A couple of days, just depending on how much pressure it is to release the pressure. But pickles don't get a lot of pressure. Sauerkraut does. And then after you like the way it tastes, put it in the fridge to slow it down. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to fill whatever jar we have with the brine first. Then we put the vegetable in and we put something on it to keep the vegetable underneath the brine, right? I would put the vegetables in first. Put the, sorry, put the vegetables in first. And yeah. then we, we have to make sure that... Whatever we do, the vegetables are underneath the brine. We check it every couple of days. When it gets to the point that we really like the taste, 
then we put it into the fridge. Yeah, and the fresher the vegetables and herbs, the better it's going to turn out. And how long can it stay in the fridge then? Um, and stay crunchy mm. quite a while, mm. probably a few months. A few months, depending okay. Depending on what it is. But, I mean, sauerkraut lasts like indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I have a batch that uh, I actually sent some to Redmond's Real Salt that was a year old, and that was their favorite one out of all the ones I sent them. Wow, yeah. very interesting. Now, this is a different one. This is one that I made, which is vinegar. I, I can't wait to try your salt method. But I used, so it's red onions and black peppercorns and bay leaves. And I used brown rice vinegar. I didn't use regular distilled vinegar. I used brown rice vinegar. And it was a one-to-one -one ratio between brown rice vinegar and water. And I think it tastes pretty good. It's got a, a nice little flavor to it also. But I, I don't think it's going to have anywhere near, I know it doesn't have anywhere near the complexity of these guys. Yeah, I mean, there's a trade-off. Like vinegar stuff lasts forever. And it's and it stays crunchy and good, so it's I mean it's it just depends on what you want to do. Like I'd say pickle, I'd do canning with vinegar or just and then and just do both. Mm -hmm. Like if you just have a garden with ton, pumping tons of stuff out, you might as well mix it up and mm -hmm. try new things, see what you like. And in China, they keep a lot of times they'll keep just a vat of brine full of herbs and things, and they'll just keep putting vegetables in it, taking them out, eating them, and just mm -hmm. keep the brine sometimes for years. Mm -hmm because it has a certain population that they like that digests it and makes it delicious. Wow. Yeah. It's a fascinating, Dan. Dan Gorman, Bubbling Brine Brothers, we're gonna to get to try these pickles and maybe we'll give a one jar away as a door prize for yeah, everybody. Yeah, I brought lots. All right, awesome. Yeah. Sounds great, thank you so much. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, okay, while you were away, I went to town on the cabbage um, and then I also grated, so that was half a head of cabbage and then two carrots. Um, so you might have noticed how much effort that took just on that half of a cabbage head. So for people who don't have the same knife skills or just a laziness or whatever, I really like to use a Cuisinart that has like the shredding uh, blade mm -hmm. for it. Um, and then it just takes two seconds. Otherwise, I also would just manually use a grater. Um, that's also possible. But for now, since I really wanted the nice little julienne slices, I did it. It's beautiful. It. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm basically, my main thing with coleslaw is that it usually has too much mayo in it and not enough flavor in it. Um, and so it ends up really like thick and goopy and or then really watery at the end. And it, that's not as exciting to me as the potential that it has as just a great salad. Um, so the way I get around that is that I use part mayo, part olive oil, because then the olive oil has a lighter quality. It also has a thinner consistency, so you're, you can create a lighter dressing on it and get away with it because it will um, more easily like surround your carrots and vegetables that's going in it. And then I have a nice fun spin on it today. Um, I brought a little bit of fresh sage that we can top it with and some cranberries because I like to add just a little bit of sweet into all the things that I do, um, especially if you have kids, makes things very kid friendly, if you can make them taste really, really good. Um, so we're just gonna add some dried cranberries on top. And then of course my little secret is like a one teaspoon of honey into it. Um, all right, so I have already mised out one half cup of mayo that's looking like a lot right now. And that is Veginase, by the way, is what oh, we're yeah. using great, yeah. with grapeseed oil. So uh, that's that works because, A, if somebody's vegan, they can eat that. And B, the only great mayo, well, other than people who love Dukes, is Hellman's. And they yeah, don't, they don't, Dukes that. is in the South, right? And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it has some... There's some liabilities for people who care a little bit about the ingredients, we'll say, <laughs> you know. But otherwise, the, the Veginase is a nice alternative for um, everybody can can find that. And especially when you mix it with all this stuff, I think it works okay. I think it'll work yeah. okay. We'll yeah. see. No, little secret. I grew up on Veganase. Is it Veganase or Veginase? I don't know. What? Um, <laughs> we'll call it whatever. What are, you call it Veganase, I'll call it Veginase, and okay, we're good. Yeah, either way. Um, and I didn't know any other mayo existed until I was a teenager. And I don't know, somebody offered me like Hellman's mayo on a burger or something like that. <laughs> and I was like very shocked that it was not the only one in the universe. <laughs> 
Um, so with this, the, I'm going to go heavier on the salt as well, um, just to help bring everything out. Well, got some tossing to do. <laughs> That's one of the things about working in the kitchen. It's fun. People, if you don't get in there, you know, you could do it with your hands too, but that's I, yeah, a little bit, that that's more fun. Yeah. <laughs> in the kitchen, I have gloves so I can just like go into everything. Oh, but then all that wonderful bacteria that Dan was talking about <laughs> isn't going to get in the food. So. <laughs> I was thinking about what you said, Dan. I was thinking that it works just about anywhere except in a restaurant where there are it's what they there. call authority i know but there are authorities who frown on you know certain things they 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 feel at least in the states that there has to be everything has to be really perfectly clean i i totally understand your point I mean, you know harboring it all. <laughs> right you you got it mm, that spoon <laughs> it's good stuff mm. i promise <laughs> <laughs> that's the one bit that used to annoy me the most about uh, food shows when I was a kid that everyone always tasted it and is like mm, oh my god it's yeah, yeah. so good and they're just like swarming about this food and you can't taste it and you can't even smell it because it's on the TV so it's hard not to do it about my own food though but I'm biased <laughs> all right so it's looking pretty good you can kind of see it has a light sheen to it but it's not thick and goopy um, and then I'm literally just going to, as a final touch, sprinkle some of my sage, sprinkle some of my cranberries. Mm. And guess what? Now it has more colors and yeah. it's even more beautiful than it before. Is. And it doesn't have to be sage. It can be almost whatever herb you want. You could throw some rosemary in there. It would be a little bit adventurous to try mint. Um, but a That's bunch... too adventurous for me. Yeah, but like definitely <laughs> parsley or cilantro or anything herbs always add liveliness mm -hmm. um, and then you could always switch out the cranberries for cherries or raisins or some other sort of blueberries i don't know well, I, I think well i think that that's really a great point that you're making have fun in the kitchen try things see you know it's not like you have to make a, an entire uh, large portion of them mm -hmm. you could make a very small portion try it to see if it works before you put it in front of everybody else. And so it, it's just fun, the experimentation that can take place in the kitchen and all the creativity that you can use channel into creating food for people who get to enjoy yeah. it and love what they eat then. Yeah, it's also a great way to like learn about food and learn about cooking yourself. Mm -hmm. So coleslaw is like a very basic, simple, you know, only a few ingredients. So it's, it's hard to screw it up. You know, there's, you know, it's, people are going to enjoy it almost no matter what, you know. Um, so play with that. You know, don't add carrots. I add the carrots because they put a lovely orange color and they're a little bit sweeter than cabbage. So they accent it really nicely. You know, um, I didn't use purple cabbage today, but, you know, go for Chinese cabbage or purple cabbage or, you know, throw in kale instead, you know, play with what you have available and don't let like, oh, coleslaw has to be cabbage. Don't let that stop you, inhibit you from that, I don't know, playfulness that's inside you. <laughs> Beautiful. So, like, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. So, like, yeah. Thorstein's daughter, yes. she's got her pop-up <laughs> up and running until August? 18th. August yes. 18th. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so, so much. much. Alora. So... I'm going to, but just before we get started right here, I'm going to ask Christy Welsh, who's helping us back there, if you would do me the favor of putting some olive oil into this pot, turning it on about five, I think, all right, and then throwing, smash those garlic cloves that are over there and toss them, they're, they're somewhere around there, I think, yeah, smash them and toss them into the oil and throw those buns in the oven and then get a <laughs> You got all this? <laughs> and then get a fry pan out of here, uh, whatever you can find, and put some olive oil in it, warm it up, and let's start getting the, the uh, tempeh rocking. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Alora Anderson, hi. Hi. You've been patiently waiting. I have, mm -hmm. and I just wanna say thank you for everyone coming tonight and taking any time they have out of their busy life to join us tonight. You mean because they're going to get to eat? Is that what you mean? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just nice to have people join. It's a very full house today, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and we're really happy, thanks to Green Building Supply and everybody's Whole Foods. We have all this wonderful, we have a place, we have a great setting, and we have wonderful food that we can use, and 
that's like the best. So every first Tuesday, we're here. The next one, by the way, is Tuesday, September the 4th. And I'm not positive who's going to be on that show yet, but we'll see. Just keep, keep uh, track of, of me and we'll, we'll figure out uh, what's going to happen. All right. So tell us, what, what are you going to do? I am just absolutely excited to share with you um, essential oils. I was so happy that someone already introduced them to you before the uh, cooking show even started. So uh, doTERRA is the essential oil I'm using, which is the only certified pure therapeutic uh, grade essential oil on the market. And today I'm sharing with you wild orange. And wild orange is the best oil in my opinion and the cheapest oil it only costs four cents a drop and this oil is coming straight from brazil and it's a hundred percent wild crafted a hundred percent sustainable and a hundred percent fair trade so we're as we're enjoying our great essential oil i'm gonna actually pass it around if i, I could i just wanted i was just gonna say can i smell that yeah yeah so <laughs> Uh, it's really, you can either smell it, that. you can put it on um, your skin. It is um, sensitive to, uh, if you get out in the sun tomorrow, if there is any, uh, <laughs> make sure to clean the skin before getting out because it lasts about 12 hours on the skin and it can be uh, sensitive as far as causing burns or something like that for yeah. sensitive. But I'll pass it around, you can smell it. It's very invigorating. Uh, mm, that is That is really wonderful. Okay, so what we're doing is we're gonna. Will you get me some more? Oh, we, oh, you're. I see. Sorry. So we're we're going to create this infused oil while Alora's talking about essential oils, and all we're doing is we're putting some. This is what you you can do this at home. It's so easy. So we're gonna put a bunch of olive oil in a pan in a pot. Sorry, and we're gonna put it on about five. This is an electric stove. More. And we're going to just warm it up. We don't want to get it hot. We don't want it to get anywhere close to smoking point. We just want to, you know, get it nice. And then what we're going to do is we're going to throw some, we're going to make a garlic infused oil. So we smash, Christy smashed the garlic cloves. And we're just going to have it, the garlic in there for maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes kind of thing. Yeah, that'll be great. And then if people want to try it, they, they can taste it and see what it tastes like. Now, this kind of oil, much different than what Allura is talking about or what Dr. Sharma talked about, this kind of oil you have to use within a few days. It's not something, I mean, you could put it in the refrigerator, but you really shouldn't put olive oil in the refrigerator. So just if you want to make infused oils at home, use it on whatever you're making that particular day or night. And, you know, if there's a little bit more that you want to keep in a cool, dark place for a few days, that's fine. But uh, it's a lot different than uh, the essential oils. All right. So back to me. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing about wild orange, since that's what we're doing today, and I even dressed in orange just to keep it in the mood, <laughs> um, is that it's very purifying to the body. So many people are having, walking around distressed with achy joints, um, you know, indigestion, maybe depressed. Wild orange can change that. Wild orange goes, if you take it internally, and like I said, you have to be very careful with what you're doing. So if you make it at home, that's amazing, and you know where the oranges are coming from. But if you don't have time to do that, buying a wild orange that can be taken internally, certified pure therapeutic brand is the best way to go. But um, it actually cleanses the lymph system. It goes internally and cleanses out the mucus and acid buildup that we build up from just eating and living. I mean, even if you don't eat anything, you're still going to build up acid. Yeah, and we have a lot of bacteria all over us, right? So Right. Well, uh, talking about bacteria, you can quickly, say you're sensitive to bacteria and you want to cleanse your hands, you can quickly take one drop of orange, rub it in your hands, boom, your hands are clean. Go on your day. Um, diffusing it. You smell good, too, at the same time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's always great. Um, and diffusing it in a, I like using an ultrasonic diffuser. Um, it helps energize you as you smell it and helps clarify just your way of thinking better. Just You can take more breaths <laughs> being around stressful situations. <laughs> but today we're going to have a lot of fun and we're going to mix it and make some ice cream. We're going to use some baby bananas and some organic strawberries and just a few drops of wild orange essential oil. Um, for a 
great taste like he was saying earlier orange julius which is one of my favorite places in the mall well it used to be i don't shop in the mall anymore but back in that time yeah that was really fun so well, they stopped using fresh oranges way before you were able to go there i'm sure of that. wow <laughs> i couldn't imagine yeah. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. So tell everybody what you're going to do so that they can do this at home because it's really simple, right? Yeah, it's so simple. All you need to do is buy some bananas. They can be, I like organic bananas, preferably I prefer baby bananas even because they're non-hybrid and they um, tend to be easier to digest and they release less sugar as you digest them. So just, you know, if you want to use a regular size banana, maybe two bananas is probably all you need for about two people. If you're looking for four people, you may want to include another one. And then uh, two cups of frozen strawberries and maybe just a few uh, teaspoons of water if you want to keep it in the ice cream mode. Um, if you want to change it into a smoothie, you can simply add more water and it will smooth it out real good. And those bananas are frozen also, right? Yes. Oh, yes. And you definitely want to take the peel off the banana before you freeze it. Yes. Hey, Christy, pull those out, will you? Let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. This is... Whoa, there we go. That's all right. Yeah, you're not supposed to do this, which is what I did, okay? Yeah, this is what I did, right? Because but then you told me your husband did the same thing, right? He did. The first time I told him to freeze bananas, this is what he did for me, which was okay because at least he did it for me, which that was very helpful. Yeah. So you make sure to unpeel the bananas, stick them in a little bag, um, and then flatten the bag out as much air out as possible. Stick them in the freezer uh, at least overnight. If you don't have time to do that, at least you know a good six hours prior so it will get some... Um, more ice cream like otherwise again you can do smoothies and then um, frozen strawberries are easy to find they come all over so luckily everybody's helped us today which is very nice and then so the i said so we're just going back to two people so just two bananas and then in this case one cup of strawberries and then we're going to add one drop of wild orange essential oil and today someone's going to have a chance to win um, 88 drops of wild essential oil and so they'll get to enjoy it in their own home and um, wow that's yeah. really nice that'll be yeah. that'll be fun you don't need this pepper probably though do you they do have a wild pe or a wild pepper mm -hmm. essential oil which mm -hmm. helps with weight loss and allergies but we're not going to use it in no, this we're not no today. not to create an orange julius right no. okay so then all they do is just put that's it in it. A, put it in their blender and go for it put it in a high speed blender mm -hmm. and then use a tamper mm -hmm. and start to just blend you're going to have to turn it on super high we'll do it in a little while mm -hmm. Uh, and blend until creamy and then you can scoop out just like ice cream and top with if you want raw cacao that's been fermented uh, my kids love cherries also mm, right yeah mm -hmm. okay that's fantastic thank you so much thank we can't so wait much. we're you were you were very kind to allow us oh, to do this after we're off the air it's so, so that's great loud anyways you guys aren't missing much right. well, no they're noise. gonna they're gonna hear it later that, taste it though. yeah so it'll be it'll be great so we're going to make the Rubens, as I said, afterwards, but I just want to show you um, what it's going to be like. So we're using tempeh, right? And we're taking the, we took each slab of tempeh and sliced it in half. Actually, Christy took each slab of tempeh and sliced it in half. And then we're going to saute that in a little bit of olive oil and tamari, all right? A little bit of olive oil and tamari. And then in addition to that, could you hand me that dressing over there? Yes, thank you so much. Oh, no, I don't need them. <laughs> and then we also made, we took veginase and we added ketchup, which is a really simple way of making Thousand Island dressing. You can't, you can't beat that. Very simple. Make it color to your taste. Let's put it that way. And taste to your color, however you like it. And then we're going to use Bubbling Brian Brothers kraut. We're going to use Bubbling Brian Brothers pickles. And... Another thing you can do, which would be awesome, is would be fantastic, would be tomatoes, but we're not going to do that. And we're going to put it on buns, and we even have some gluten-free buns for some people who might need that. Um, so that's what's going to happen. And the one thing about a Reuben, which you have to keep in mind, really important, it needs to actually drip, okay? That's how a Reuben has to be. It has to drip. If you don't have enough dressing on it to drip, 
It's not right, all right? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have all of you here at Green Building Supply for great taste, a presentation of Fairfield Media Center sponsored by Green Building Supply and everybody's Whole Foods. And we hope that you'll join us again on Tuesday, September the 4th for our next show. Thank you. Great taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.